important uh, management. Oh, uh, just a minute. Let me get that. Okay. Um, to understand how prudential insurance might be a uh, allied to the nonprofit world directly reading, dealing with real estate donations that were offered. And uh, uh, at the end of uh, about three years of going uh, all of these seminars, uh, uh, I decided to um, go out from uh, Prudential and form my own consulting practice in, uh, in a way to help charities across the country learn about the opportunities for real estate gifting and to act as a consultant and a bridge to the, non to the real estate industry itself. So I always like to characterize what's happened over the last 26 years that I've been in the space is that the, the nonprofit world and real estate industry have crashed into each other and still doing a mating dance to figure out how the two of them can benefit their clients. For you, a donor, for the real estate specialist, uh, their client that may have bought a number of pieces of real estate. And over the period of time, I started uh, initially with the chancellor's office with Lori and I back almost 14 years ago and uh, have moved forward to, to Wendy, who uh, both of whom get me involved early with the campuses where real estate uh, raises its head to be the donation of choice. And I've done a number of, uh, of donations on behalf of the various campuses around California. And I've also provided advice on whether or not to even take a piece of real estate and see what problems we could solve. So that's my introduction into the Pope Chancellor's Office and all of your campuses. I used to live in California and have visited probably half of the campuses over the period of uh, my time there. Um, I wanna go on to the second slide and I'm sorry, we're, we're having a delay that yeah, may do it another way. Nope. There we go. <clears throat> Be before I before I really get started, I want to give you just the impact <clears throat> that real estate plays in the nonprofit world. Um, real estate represents forty four percent of all of the assets held by Americans in the country. Cash, on the other hand, only represents 14% of the asset base of Americans. And so real estate represents three to one, actually, on compared to cash when you're out looking for donations in most or most of the organizations I've dealt with are looking for simple cash uh, transactions going forward. Uh, the last time we did a, an analysis on how much real estate was coming through qualified charities across the country, uh, it appeared that there was about $4 billion a year that are given to various charities across the country. And 80% of all gifts of real estate are rejected out of hand, which amounts to about $16 billion a year of equities that are being passed over by charities for any number of reasons. Some of those um, are, um, the charities are basically concerned about the risk of ownership, environmental problems, holding costs. Your time to manage your donor and manage through a process that could take six or nine months uh, to come from the time that they originally contact you or you contact them. And, uh, and also the campuses virtually never doing the kind of planned gifts that you might be talking about. So there's, a, there's lots of reasons to have them rejected uh, other than uh, the properties are too small, there are innate problems with the property and that sort of thing. So that's <clears throat> kind of what you're faced with, you have to have within your campus and, um, and the vice president's office, you've got to have a mechanism to rapidly take in the information and see whether or not a potential gift is going to work. And one of my, one of my 
caveats to the nonprofit world is that real estate donations are perishable. When a donor is ready to make a gift to you or another organization, they don't want to be put on hold for months on end why it works its way through the hierarchy of your university or AARP foundation or UNICEF, other sorts of people you have. If you're going to go into this area, you have to be ready to pull the trigger and stay on top of it with the donor. And that's why I really uh, take my hat off to both Lori and Wendy because they get me in early in the process when something happens so we can show the donors on a on a regular basis that we are making progress, what's going on. So they don't lose interest and go down the street to another charity, their church, uh, boys and girls club, whatever, and take a gift that you could have otherwise have gotten. The message that I instill in virtually every charity that I make a presentation to is that you've got to let People know that Cal, the, your Cal State campus takes real estate. You think that that's a very simple message, but when you go on a donor meeting and you sit before them and you talk about everything that's going on on your campus, um, and you mention the fact that your, you know, your university does and does look into the gifts of real estate. You don't take everything, but you do under the right set of circumstances, the conversations can virtually explode. My history, I'm, I was a plan giving officer at George Washington University in DC and, and many of our alumni never had any idea that George Washington University took real estate. So you've gotta be just as simple as saying, did you know we took, take real estate and see where it goes? In addition to the fact you, that you do take real estate, you need to let them know that the property doesn't have to be in California, that you've got a mechanism in place to take it virtually anywhere in the country and convert their gift into something that they want to use to support the organization. And uh, so they don't have to think about only their personal home or something, uh, something that they have in California. It, it opens it up. In the order of the types of properties taken, single family residential is probably 75% of everything you're going to see in the way of gifting opportunities. The children don't want it. Um, it may have some uh, physical problems on it that nobody really wants to touch. And you have to evaluate whether or not the time and effort to fix those problems is worthwhile and who pays for it and that sort of thing. But you're gonna see single family homes, which most people think traditionally uh, is where most Americans have uh, plunked a lot, of their, <laughs> a lot of their money and assets and own free and clear properties and uh, never thought about using their home to fund uh, their philanthropic uh, legacy. Uh, second homes, uh, specifically uh, resort condos, the children no, wanna, no longer want to travel to. They've got young children, and it just doesn't make sense. If you live in California, and uh, over the period of time you had lived in the East Coast, and you've got something in Maine or North Carolina, it does cause problems. So secondary homes are wonderful opportunities. When I talk about vacant land, uh, people have bought wonderful home lots on beach areas or on lakes, and they intend to build their retirement home. And because of economic downfall, health issues, or just a lack of interest in going through the building process, they now own a $250,000 uh, lot in North Carolina, that would be a perfect gift opportunity. But when I talk about vacant land, although technically a farm or a ranch is not all vacant land, uh, it does expand and I've done ranches and I've done farms uh, across the country. And uh, there is a, um, those are those for children and grandchildren to pick up after the parents or grandparents have become more problematic. And so the, when I speak in terms of vacant land, I put under parentheses uh, ranches and, um, and farmland. Rental properties, surprisingly enough, uh, are 
quite often managed by a couple for years and years. It's produced a good deal of income for them, but they're tired of getting the call in the middle of the night that somebody's been locked out or a window's been broken or something has gone wrong. So they are looking to use their rental property to fund any number of the types of uh, donation arrangements that you might have. I, um, another large area, and these come in, in really high volume numbers are surplus corporate real estate. Uh, corporations that wanna be good citizens, good corporate citizens, and they have research going on at your university or something may have may end up with a duplicate building in another state that they no longer need. And it is a perfect uh, vehicle for you to ask about. We cover all of those different areas. So it's not, uh, it's not difficult to do industrial and uh, uh, office complexes, medical complexes, and that sort of thing. The, again, <clears throat> the central fair by any national charity any university is that if we take ownership and we hit an environmental issue or we have costs and it takes us a long time to sell it, we don't want to get involved. It's easier to say no and move on to an easier project to work on. I'm going to share with you a mechanism this morning on how you can avoid that and make it virtually risk-free to your university. And it's the one the chancellor's office and I have been using for some time for annuities, but it's equally uh, applicable to outright gifts and that sort of thing. So that is going to be one of the key elements that you're going to be able to carry back. Uh, adding, uh, using real estate for somebody who wants to do a gift to a Cal State uh, runs the gamut. You guys have seen all sorts of it. Uh, if there's research going on in an area that somebody met, especially medical, or um, maybe agricultural even for some new development, and a chance to, to add in property to bolster that program is a great way to do it. And we see a lot of major gifts for naming rights on buildings. So um, that's a uh, those are sort of the areas that you might look at in discussions and how they could use their uh, properties equity to solve a, um, a donation arrangement. I'm not sure I said it, but the average, the average gift of real estate uh, adds up to about $425,000 is the average gift size. So we're not talking about small um, small gifting arrangements. Here are basically, I'm leaving um, lead trust uh, out of this conversation. I've been in this a long time and I've never done a lead trust. I know they go on, but I, that would be an unusual animal for you to run across uh, with a piece of real estate. I take my hat off to you if you actually have done one. Outright donations of real estate by definition means that there's no debt on the property. So you can take the property and once it's sold after closing costs, you're going to net out uh, the equity in the property. And you can generally calculate on a free and clear property after real estate commissions, title, title company, title insurance, tax prorations, it's about 10% of the value of the property is going to be what it costs for you to sell it. So even though you're looking at a million dollar property, you really, you know, in fact, are looking at probably $900,000. Although uh, most organizations book it at a million, not the net projected uh, proceeds out of it. However your campus handles it, it's no problem. Bargain sales may be a term that you're not particularly familiar with, but a bargain sale by definition is a piece of property that either number one has a mortgage on it, or number two, the donor is going to get a portion of the equity when the property is sold and the charity is going to get a portion of the equity uh, at closing. Um, those uh, arrangements, uh, 
and where there's debt on a property has been another big concern for charity in addition to the question of UBIT. And uh, the folks yesterday that I listened to part of their presentation were saying how much the kiss of death uh, UBIT is for an organization, whether you're funding a charitable remainder trust, gift annuity, or, or a bargain sale, you've got some real issues that you have to uh, deal with. And again, the solution I'm going to share with you this morning on the risk side of it also addresses the UBIT side of the question. Uh, retained life estates are normal across the country, but my understanding under the rules from the from your chancellor's office is that if you go into title on the property and let somebody live in it for the rest of their lives, when you get ready to sell it, you've got some special rules that you have to deal with. So I think for the sake of our discussion today, we're going to take real uh, retained life estates off the table because that's just that's butting your head against the wall from what I understand. And no reason to do that other than, you know, on, on a joyous morning like this, we ought to be, we ought to be upbeat about the things that we can do rather than the ones we can't. Uh, a charitable remainder trust funded with real estate, again, has to be free and clear to avoid UBIT. And for the charity is the remainderman, you don't really have any problems. It's the trustee that has to sell the property, has to maintain it while it's on the market and that sort of thing. Um, if you're going to do a, uh, if you're going to do an income charitable remainder trust, it's going to be in the form of a flip trust that you're going to wait until the property sold. The trust is funded with cash, and then preferably have some lead time before the first payments due, and that's negotiated in your donation agreement up front. The most difficult, I well maybe a lead trust is more difficult, but. From a practical standpoint, charitable gift annuities are the most difficult for plan giving officers and uh, the organizations to handle because historically, charities shied away from it because someone would offer them a million dollar gift annuity in the form of real estate equity. The charity would discount it by the 10% they think it's going to uh, sell and, and benefit the, the pool for the gift annuity. Uh, and lo and behold, the market moves on them. And they've got a $900,000 gift annuity contract with the donor, but the property only sells for $750,000. So you've got an upside down gift annuity starting out. And that has not made a lot of people happy. And that's why the gift annuities are not right now in vogue. If your donor wants to go go that direction, probably a charitable remainder uh, annuity trust is a, a better option for it, but don't have to make that decision this morning. Just be aware that, uh, again, my magic bullet that I'm going to share shortly with you takes care of that issue, and it is the one that the chancellor's office uh, prefers, gift, the gift annuities funded with real estate uh, that they're going to use. I would like to go back up to bargain sale and, and split gifting arrangements because basically if the donor is going, let's say it's a million dollar property and the donor wants 250,000 in cash and the charity gets $750,000, that's a, that's a split gifting arrangement. But it doesn't have to stop there. The charity, the, the bargain sale and the 750,000 could fund a gift annuity it could be a percentage of the property could be put into a charitable remainder trust, uh, or you could take the $750,000 and give half of it to, to the donor's church if that's what they wanna do, and your university would take half of it. That's still in my case study would be about a $350,000 gifting arrangement, but that can all be done under the bargain sale contract donation agreement. So you can uh, slice and dice uh, that arrangement in many different ways to benefit what the donor wants to do and the fact that they don't want to give your university all 750000 They would like to make another portion of the same equity go to a third-party charity. Here's what normally happens. Uh, 
somebody approaches or you approach somebody and they've got a, a piece of real estate, uh, you have got outside consultants that help you evaluate a gifting arrangement. Most universities, it's the facility management division that take a look at a piece of property if it's local. And then the determination is that you're going to go forward with the gifting arrangement. Historically, again, what's happened is the Cal State system, like every other charity in the country over years and years and years, then takes title to the property. And it is at that point that you're off to the races for all kinds of problems. I have not, in my career, been involved in a real estate transaction that has not run into a problem. Some of them are not so tough, but most of them are unexpected and you need somebody that can help on a solution. And owning a piece of property at the university level, trying to solve real estate problems in Florida or Maine or Alaska is not going to make your CFO very happy nor general counsel. So here is, here is the preferred mechanism that's used by my clients and other charities across the country. It's called a simultaneous closing. The same platform we're looking at here occurs. The donor comes to you with the property. You do your due diligence on it. You make a contract that you agree to accept the property but you add one other provision in the donation agreement, which gives the university the right to direct the donor to deed the property to the third party buyer that the university goes out and contracts with. So you don't have sequential deeding and you, the university, never have to go in title. The donor gets the charitable deduction and all the benefits and the cash comes to the university and you avoid environmental issues, cost of holding, and all of the other things that you would have on this normal procedure that I demonstrate right here where you go into title. It can be used for charitable gift annuities. It can be, um, it can be used for bargain sales, it, it used for outright gifts. In other words, you hold out the closing of the property and the university hires a, a real estate broker, contracts with the third party buyer and you put provisions in those contracts that says, you understand we don't own title of this property. We've got an equitable right under our donation contract to tell the donor to deed it to you if you are happy with the sales price. And this avoids a lot of time that the staff has to take when they're dealing with real estate issues. There's no holding cost for any litany of things for a, a home in Hawaii or something else. So it's, it's the most pristine way for you to take an equity of real estate and turn it into cash without all of the expense and brain brain twisting things that you run across in real estate and you out you bring in outside consult outside consultants that bring the realtors the title companies local attorneys and everything to the table but you as a fundraiser this is so simple you can step back and report to your donor that, that this is what's happened this week we have a buyer we're going to have a closing in three weeks and we're going to send you over a deed that you're going to need to sign to Mr. and Mrs. Smith that are buying your beautiful home in Pacific Palisades for $5 million. And uh, Cal State Fullerton's going to get a check for $4,500,000 from First American Title Company. And everybody comes out what they negotiated to get. So the simultaneous closing, and I'm willing to share um, with, uh, with you all uh, an explanation of that that we can, we can pass around. Uh, but that is the key to what I'm talking about today. And that allows you to enter into a bargain sale for a million dollar property in which the donors are going to get $400,000 and you never have to write a check. You just 
have to go find a buyer that comes to the table and you close on everything in a single closing. It cuts costs for you so there aren't two closings. And in some states in the country, especially Maryland, there's an 8% transfer fee on the gross value of the property. So on a million dollar property, if you had to take title to it and then reconvey it to a third party buyer, it would cost you $80,000 that you don't have to pay by using a simultaneous closing. Now, if, if that hasn't been an exciting overview, I don't know what is. That's, um, it's, uh, it takes some time to get used to it, but it's a proven way to handle it. Um, you, uh, you, you can do one of two, you can do one of two ways to solve the risk factor. You can hire a consultant to help you through the process and go forward, or you can find a facilitating charity like a community foundation or um, charitable gift solutions in Jacksonville, Florida, or any number of other charities that are more adept at taking real estate and you can take a million dollar property to them, have them do all the work and split it in some fashion with them. 70, 30, 70% coming to your uh, campus, 30% going to the other campus, or it can go down to 95% to you and 5% to the other charity who would not have gotten anything from this donor had you not brought them a piece of real estate that they need to manage the process and have a successful closing. So those are the options. Uh, the one, the other, obviously the other one, but the one I skipped over is that you can turn everything over to your internal management folks and uh, have the facility managers uh, work with this in whatever fashion they do. And if, again, if they're going to take title to the property, and, not, and the property is not going to be used by the university, you have other issues you have to deal with. So uh, owning, uh, owning the process and keeping all of the net proceeds is the preferred way to go. I'm going to go through a, about four, well, <clears throat> when you do your due diligence, this is just sort of some of the things that, uh, that you need to look at, and this is what a facilitating charity is would be doing. They'd get uh, appraisals on the property and building inspections and all sorts of things. Unfortunately, most organizations, when they're offered real estate, start layering costs on the donors. A donor brings you a million dollar piece of property, and the first thing you tell them is to go out and get an appraisal. The next thing, you know, that's seven or eight hundred dollars, but it's time consuming. The next thing is to get an environmental impact study, which might cost seventy five hundred dollars and might take four months to go through. Uh, as I told you, these gifts are perishable. And to tell the donor that uh, it's going to be four months before you could possibly give them an answer on it isn't a message they want to hear. On the alternative, if you'd say, look, we'll, we'll do a quick due diligence on this and enter into a contract with you, but we're gonna ask you to hold the property while we find a buyer that's satisfactory to us, is progress. And if they've got a good piece of property and it's listed correctly in the marketplace, it should sell. Sometimes they don't, but uh, you're able to, it, that's one of the other nice things about a simultaneous close. If it doesn't sell for a, a value that you feel comfortable with, you can walk away from the gift from the donor and they can go about their business and sell it themselves. That's one of the surprises that you might get when you start marketing a property is that something in the neighborhood that we didn't see initially impacts the value or might actually freeze the saleability of a property. Okay, oh, sorry, it moved faster than I thought. Uh, here's an, just an outright gift and sort of how it, how it might work. Uh, folks that owned a office building, they had an insurance company in it and they were retiring and decided to give it to a local church. And so they had the property appraised. 
Uh, after the donation was completed, they transferred the property to this charity directly, and they got a the donors got a qualified appraisal that said it was worth 425,000. So they took a charitable deduction uh, usable out over six years against their adjusted gross income. I'm not going to talk tax law, but um, uh, that's the relevant opportunity for a donor to benefit from a charitable deduction. Here's a bargain sale that was, uh, shows how it impacts a donor that had a, had a property, but it was 40% vacant. And uh, they wanted to uh, donate the property, but they needed $150,000 for some other tax issues and to clean up some other debts. So the charity entered into a, into a bargain sale in which they gave the donors $150,000 uh, of the $700,000 uh, $700, value. And after you allocate basis for, uh, for the property, from a tax standpoint, the federal tax and state tax savings was 141,000. And, um, and there, so you add that on top of the 150 cash they got, that they actually liquidated this property that had some problems for them and uh, benefited to the tune of $291,000 uh, and fulfilled their philanthropic goal for the local church. So it was a nice, clean transaction. And this would be a, a number one type class in bargain sales and, and relatively simple to do. I talked about farms and farms have a unique opportunity with them that they can take a retained life estate in a farm. And uh, we had some folks that they had been on a farm and the kids did not want it. And uh, they, had a, they had a huge profit in it. They paid the 175 and now almost worth a million. They wanted to live out their, li their lives on the farm. So they took, they took the gift to the charity that went into title and sat on it, but it provided this couple a charitable deduction of almost $650,000 that they used against some of the income from their other investments. So they were... They were recognized for their legacy up front. They got to stay on their beautiful farm until they decided that they wanted to move into town. And they got the benefits that the federal government gave to them after doing some allocation for life expectancy on what they received in the charitable deduction. Not exactly a crescendo case, but works. Uh, here was an unusual case where we, uh, the Charitable Remainder Trust was funded with real estate, uh, and it was a flip trust. The original appraisal on the property, fair market value, it was indicated at $900,000, and the Charitable Remainder Trust, when, fund, when it flipped, was going to pay 6.5% interest. Uh, the real estate consultant said, rather than try and sell the property in a traditional fashion, why don't we do an auction? And at the auction, the price came in, the sales price was $1,200,000, and the buyer paid the real estate commission, which amounted to $120,000 on this property. So the donors came out with a $78,000 income out of this for life and, the, and a $460,000 charitable deduction, which made everybody very happy and a surprise, but you need to consider whether or not within a trust or in some other fashion that you wanna do a, um, an auction. Uh, they do cost some money up front, but uh, on a specific type of, of case, the auctioneer might carry their feed forward if they're dealing with a charity. All righty, time delayed. 
Okay, I'm, the, the options that, uh, that we've talked about are hiring a consultant well before the time you're going to get a gift of real estate, not the day after you get it where it takes time to arrange the contract and everything else and you lose momentum with your donors. There are charities, there's one in Santa Fe called Realty Gift Fund that splits the, they take the property, either take title or do a simultaneous closing and uh, they share in the gifting arrangement with uh, you, the university. And the bottom line is if you're going to reject the real estate gift anyway, it's worth getting 70, 80 or 90% of the net proceeds instead of zero. And using a facilitating charity, whoever you choose is a way to save the major portion of these gifting arrangements. There are charities that will that can issue gift annuities uh, and they would take real estate, but most of them require a 50-50 split on whatever you're taking in because they're on the hook for uh, the payments. If it doesn't go through the chancellor's office for whatever reason, uh, at least there's a port in the storm and you might be able to find something. My, the last thing is that my sensitivity as a plan giving officer at George Washington was we all were running 110 miles an hour. We don't want to get sucked into a black hole on the first real estate transaction or the eighth real estate transaction we've ever done. Who do we assemble around us that have a proven track record that can actually help us and minimize the time that we spend with these types of organizations? Uh, to summarize what I've just gone over uh, in the last 40 minutes or so is that real estate is a huge opportunity if you seize on it now. The local real estate community needs to know that you're interested in real estate because they may have clients who have gotten older that never knew that they could use real estate, all or a portion of it, to fund something at a university that they've lived next to or have been involved with for a long period of time. By using a simultaneous closing, you avoid the risk that most charities are concerned with and you can move on down the road feeling comfortable that you haven't caused the university to stub their toe and never want to take another piece of real estate, which often happens after the first very bad experience. Um, your time, your time is important, and uh, above all, we have to be sensitive to what the donors want. These are not these are not commercial transactions. These are wonderful people that are reaching out with your help, or by themselves, or they've heard about you, and they want to do something that's going to leave a legacy for them. So listening what kind of gifting arrangement, what options they've got uh, is a way to really feel like you've done something not only for you, the university, but for the donors. And quite often their children remember what you've done and there is a long tail to some of these gifts. Uh, at one point we saw two or three residual donations of real estate after the first one's gone successfully. So. Um, the world's open to you out there, and I hope that I have provided you with information this morning that would be helpful in, in you considering uh, taking real estate, uh, asking for real estate, and uh, being in the poker game. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chase. That was a, a very helpful presentation. And I love the, the, the way you underscored that one, we should not be afraid of these types of gifts. Uh, and that two, there are mechanisms and there are consultants and there are folks that we can bring in to help out. Um, and that we can ultimately use these to, to leverage quite very successful support for our programs. Um, I want to, I see that Allie has a hand raised, so I'll turn to her first. I was going to ask the group if there were questions, but I think Allie's already there. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Chase. Um, so what's so interesting is you're the second person now that has mentioned how plan giving officers should be partnering with real estate agents. 
not just for the reason that you just described, but certainly people are working very remote now. And so people are moving into perhaps our communities that, um, you know, or could be potential supporters, but still have jobs elsewhere. So I was just wondering if you've seen any, like how that partnership works, you know, we're used to working with our allied partners with like CPAs and, um, you know, attorneys, but this real estate agent thing has really gotten me thinking about how we can better utilize them as a resource in our communities. I formed a, uh, a tri alliance with uh, CB commercial real estate. They're one of the large uh, con investment industrial brokerage houses across the country. We worked with their Detroit regional office and a um, supplier of technology for title companies and banks to consolidate the use of the charity and those other two entities to approach corporate America and the banking industry who has a responsibility to uh, either give cash funding within their communities, or they could use real estate to do the same thing. So if your university uh, has several banks in the area and they're under a community funding uh, arrangement where they have to do a couple hundred thousand dollars a year uh, for local compliance, if they repossessed a piece of real estate that was worth a million dollars, they could they could pay forward five years of their community funding responsibility by giving you a piece of real estate. And it was that market that we were going after uh, until uh, COVID froze a, a lot of the things that were going on in the real estate industry. Home sales, people have to live somewhere. They have to live in an apartment. They have to do a lot of things. But a corporation doesn't have to move their corporate offices from Detroit or Minneapolis to Sarasota, Florida, they put, just put it on hold, but it's out there. And I have spoken to the National Real Estate Association and have implored the, the brokers to get involved with their local charities. Uh, brokers are uh, centered around communities. They want to give back in many ways. Well, their expertise on real estate uh, and clients that might be a, a donor to your uh, university is a perfect way to go and invite them in and, and share with them um, the programs that are available. And they have a vested interest in not only having a successful transaction, but if they're the listing agent on the property, they get to sell something they wouldn't have otherwise had an opportunity to even have their hands on. So it's a marketing area for them to really develop. Thank you, Allie, for the question and, and Chase for that, that great response. Um, uh, I'll pause here to see if anybody else has a raised hand to ask a question. Feel free to jump off me. Go ahead, Liz. Um, just to piggyback off of Allie's question, um, I do meet with real estate agents. Um, I specifically make sure that they have experience working with seniors and I come to find out there's actually a special certification that they can get that um, I don't know, helps them better work with seniors, which is usually the population that we work with. Um, and it's been phenomenal um, for multiple reasons. If we get a gift in a trust or will, you know, I can lean on them to sell it. Or uh, most recently, a, a Heritage Society member wanted help selling something he inherited. And I was like, oh, I have the perfect person for you. And she was just phenomenal. She worked so hard. But having that part partnership with us she was willing to go like above and beyond her you know call of duty yep. she, like finding the cat that lived in the house a whole <laughs> just crazy things but she knows you know she she has she stands to do a lot of business with fresno state so she's really going to go above and beyond um you know it's just one of those kind of like financial advisors or insurance planners you got to be careful because then everyone's going to be coming to you and wanting to meet so I've, I've chosen them wisely I, I know they're you know they're ethical and they're very helpful and um yeah that's it uh, I would suggest if you have a business school that you are uh, that you ask to make a presentation on plan giving at the business school they may not be your current donors but they may have parents or grandparents that are helping fund their college degrees, or they may go out into an area and say, look, I remember back when I was in business school that 
that Fresno State or whomever has a has a, a program where we can give this real estate as easily as sell it, pay the taxes on it, and then give it to the give it to the university. So I spoke at the university's business school, the law school, the accounting school. Uh, everybody knew that uh, that you were in the business to take real estate, and they need to hear it. Thank you for sharing, Liz. And then Vince, uh, please, you have a hand. Oh, you're on. You're moot there. Oh. You're, you're still on mute, Vince. I know. I've got there, it. We there we go. are. <laughs> yeah, good. All these screens to deal with over here. Um, we do have it at Cal Poly Pomona Foundation that does have a real estate coordinator, but I'm curious about um, out of state, accepting out of state real estate, as well as um, um, excess corporate real estate. Uh, don't know whether, don't, don't think they've dealt much with that. They don't, dealt, don't think that they've dealt at all with out of state real estate. So, you know, what, what can I bring to his table um, so that we don't fear or that our board our philanthropic foundation board doesn't fear uh, looking at or accepting out of state real estate or excess corporate holdings. If you'd comment on that, Chase, that'd be great. Yes, the, Vince, the fact that you're, if you use a simultaneous closing and never go into title on the property, it doesn't really matter where it is. Um, the problem arises where you go into title and you have uh, to pay utilities, you've got to have security guards and other sorts of things. But what controls under a simultaneous directed closing is that it's all done by contract. You and uh, IBM's got a you know small office building in North Carolina and they offer it to you. You contract with IBM under the understanding that you're going to hire the brokers, you're going to go out and find the buyer, and all you do is have them at the title company transfer title directly to that new buyer. So there shouldn't be any fear on going out of state for these properties. If you were going to take title, that's a whole nother story. But if you're going to either do a simultaneous closing or you're going to use a facilitating charity that takes title and shares in the proceeds with you, you're really sailing along risk-free. And that's what it's set up to do. Okay, thank you. Alrighty. Any other questions from the group? The there was one in the chat during oh go ahead, Holly. This is maybe an obvious one, I'm sorry, but um the the gift fund, the real estate gift fund, so that so it's obviously for the campus, but it can be split with the donor or a charity. So basically the campus becomes a conduit for if part of it goes to the church or the donor, is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. just wanna make sure. Yeah, it's all done. It's actually all done on a closing statement where the title company distributes the funds as, as the donation contract calls for. 10% to the church, 60% to your university, 30% to uh, the donor who's gonna get part cash and makes two donations simultaneously. And I do another question, just any thoughts about um, commercial property and particularly office space, given the pandemic and emptying office space, any special considerations around being approached around office space? Well, if you mean, if, if you mean fee simple, not lease space, fee simple applies with the same rules as a house. Uh, somebody's got a vacant medical building and they want to give it to you. Uh, you enter into a donation agreement with the provision that you're not going to, you have the option of either taking it or selling it to a third party buyer that you go out and find. If you don't find a buyer, the donation agreement ceases after 120 days or whatever you agree to, and the donor still has their building and you haven't expended any money or anything else uh, to go get it. Uh, so uh, office buildings are going to be re purpose. We're seeing a lot of downtown office buildings being converted to residential, senior housing, uh, medical uh, support type arrangements. Uh, so uh, shouldn't have any fear. The main issues are, uh, you know, 
is the, is the construction, uh, will the construction withhold a renovation of an older building would be the main issue that you would ask on, a, on an office building. Uh, something built in the, the 30s, the 20s, or the 1800s may have a few problems that, that uh, wouldn't pass local code. Thank you. And again, the, the kind of optimal, easiest, most convenient situation is the simultaneous closing, right? Because that way, all the, all the way, the, uni the only thing the university sees at the end of it is, is cash that gets put to work. That's right. Instead of thinking about real estate equities, just think in terms of cash. Alrighty, going to give, uh, we have a few more minutes here, three to be exactly, to, to see if there's any other questions. There was one in the chat earlier I was going to say, but that was more directed at Wendy. Um, and, and, and Hart, you're welcome to, to connect with Wendy again if you have a particular um, example of, of, of one of those trusts. Uh, and, and I'm available if you would like to call and have a specific question that hasn't been answered today and that sort of thing that would help you move to the next level and your real estate program. Mm -hmm. Jace has helped uh, a couple of our campuses on, on a simultaneous sale. Um, I think most recently our Dominguez Hills campus, they sold a couple multi-unit properties um, for cash and became, it was a very successful gift. Um, I also went ahead in the chat and dropped uh, Case's new book on uh, some of these considerations that we're discussing for accepting gifts of real estate. Um, it's more a how-to manual than like a publication. Uh, so <laughs> feel free to check that one out too. Um, uh, I see Wendy has a hand, but Marge also came off mute. Did you, Marge, did you want to go first? Well, um, I don't know if Ian is is within earshot, but he was um, instrumental in landing a real estate gift um, that had actually been left in, in a donor's will, that um, it was the type of thing where she inherited the house from her parents. She herself had very um, limited means. But when she passed away, she had left the house to us and it resulted in a million plus gift, which was amazing. And Ian really managed the whole process and certainly made it seem easy on my end <laughs> because I just saw the money at the end, which was pretty amazing. But um, I think these are really valuable gifts for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marge. I'm going to see if, if Ian uh, has anything to add. Uh, I would just like to say on inherited properties where an estate attorney informs you that they've got a property and they want to deed it to you, uh, we've been most successful in having uh, the uh, state attorney or trustee hold the property, don't transfer it, and then go out and find a buyer that um, they're able to uh, transfer the title directly to and the, and the university gets the money. So, and... Uh, state attorneys are wonderful and their administrative assistants are wonderful, but they're not real estate experts on lease shopping centers in Hawaii or uh, hotels in Ireland or anything else. They, they're very good at what they do, but they're not real estate experts. And they just throw darts on finding a local agent with some sort of expertise to help them through it. It's not when it's in your community, you've got all the expertise that you could possibly need. But once you move out geographically away from California, you've got some you've got some issues. And then Wendy, you, you had a thought as well. I just wanted to clarify because um, you had mentioned Hart had a question. I went back through the chat. <laughs> so in the chat, I had put Chase that for retained life estate, we we the CO doesn't accept them for charitable gift annuities. But this, the, there's no policy in terms of retained life estate for any of the campuses. So any of the campuses uh, uh, can do um, retained life estates. They just have to consider their financial liability in terms of how long it takes to sell a property. Uh, there's issues. And anyways, that, I just wanted to clarify that it's just the terrible gift annuities that, that we um, yeah, all the all well, the guidance um, that that comes from the CSU is just for the the the, the CGA program. For right. life. But, but but my understanding was if any of the university took title and turned around to sell it, they had to offer it to other uh, governmental agencies within the state that's, and then put it on the market upon the death of the donor. 
Is that a misunderstanding of the, of the law? So it's, it's not tied to the death of the donor, but um, this is a situation that we found out when we sold the, the chancellor's residency um, that used to be um, uh, owned by, by the CSU Foundation and the CSU, uh, well, no, by the CSU, the university side, is that um, since the university, not the auxiliaries, when the university accepts title of a property, um, it becomes uh, government property because we're part of the, the government of California. So when we go to sell something that's owned by the university, has title by the university, um, we first have to offer it to other agencies in the state of California for them to bid on it because that's it's a rule that says, um, uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't quite sell a piece of it off until we offer it to the rest of the organization, in this case, the organization being the state of California. Um, so that's, that's another consideration too, is um, if, if something gets uh, um, accepted by the university, it's gonna have a, a much more rigorous process to, to sell. Um, yeah. But again, a, a, another argument for the simultaneous closing process that you don't, you don't, we don't want to get into the business of, of owning property and the things that come with it. You we're just interested in, in, in ultimately in the cash to put it to work toward, towards our programs. Thank you. But the, campus and, and Wendy, the campus foundation doesn't have that. Wendy, no. I have to thank you. Wendy, I, I thank you for clarifying that. The fact that you, the campuses can do retain life estates is wonderful. So I, I did pass over that in my presentation, but I, those are wonderful gifts and I've done a lot of those. So thank you for stepping in and, and correcting me on that. No worries. And I think the only thing that, cause I had emailed Lori and like, just to make sure, <laughs> but it was just uh, her, her only thing was regarding the maintenance and taxes during um, the retained estate and considering the financial liability. I think Ben's put in the chat that there's California statute in terms of who's responsible for certain things. So uh, I don't have an, yeah. more information on, on that, but I just wanted to clarify, we don't have a policy against it. It's, it's the, the state issue and um, for the CGAs as well. Okay. I, I thought I'd chime in real quick since Marge had, had kind of called me out there and, and it came <laughs> up in terms of a retained life estate and for accidentally uh, typing pests in the uh, chat, I, the, the, uh, where I was going with that um, is a, a part of the nuances that I found interesting with uh, taking the retained life estate and taking ownership uh, from the university was all of the little items that you had to watch for in terms of whether uh, there was pests, there was termites, um, the if there was any uh, remaining personal property left in the home, uh, paying taxes. Uh, we had a tree that was leaning into the neighbor's property that had to be taken care of, uh, landscaper bills that had to be paid. All the just there were just kind of little things that piled up that you don't really think about when you take on a property um, on first brush. Uh, in addition to um, just looking at the value of it, uh, and so there was you really do need someone to coordinate all those little pieces as well. So I just thought. I'd, I'd chime in with that piece we we generally have uh, have the donors under the contract responsible for all the carrying costs uh, while they're living in the property and so yes after they're gone and you go in that's when some surprises can jump up <laughs> jump up Well, I want to give uh, another big thank you to, uh, to Chase for, for uh, giving us this presentation and imparting a lot of this fun uh, knowledge on us. Um, Gifts of Real Estate have been growing in uh, slight popularity in the CSU, so this was a, is a very apt uh, topic to discuss uh, with the group here. Um, uh, that being said, you, uh, I'll forward along Chase's contact information in my follow-up email today. And then of course, the, the link I dropped in the chat, you can very quickly find it on his website as well to reach out with any questions. Um, again, big thanks, Chase. <laughs> you're welcome. No, I have enjoyed it. Thank you. Super. And you're welcome to hang out uh, and listen to us talk about uh, reporting <laughs> and data <laughs> management <laughs> right after this. Uh, so your call. Um... Thank you, Chase. Okay, Vince. All right.